Welcome to my, my session. Welcome from Austria, Europe. Uh, and welcome to 45 minutes of uh, Power BI and uh, Synapse Analytics. Um, Simon already says, well, my name is Wolfgang. I'm a data platform MVP. I work as a data consultant in Austria, and uh, I like to work with data. Uh, I started in the data warehousing field and uh, quickly, well, moved into the reporting, data modeling, everything like that stuff. So. In the last five years, I was very, very uh, focused on, on Power BI and everything around the data platform. And now with the Synapse Analytics, the new stuff that I want to show you in the next uh, minutes, well, Power BI gets some real power behind the scenes to get data from almost everywhere to prepare the data. And uh, that's the topic of today. And what I also like, yeah, it was already in the in the in the video. I like to speak at conferences. I like to organize conferences, and I'm well. I'm one of the authors of the Power BI for Dummies book. So it's in German only. But if you want to learn German and Power BI, that would be a great idea. So why why is there a requirement for yet another data preparation tool? And uh, well. Almost every business, no, let's put out the almost, all businesses are data businesses because data is essential for uh, companies, for everything to be successful. And uh, almost 15 years ago, there was one of those sentences which started to be famous and it was the data is the new oil sentence. And that one was said 2006. And uh, there is just one thing to add. Data itself, it's not the new oil. It's only valuable when it's refined. But if it's unrefined, you cannot really use it. And so it's almost important to have a look at data like water. Water needs to be accessible. Data needs to be accessible. And it needs to be cleaned and it is needed to survive. And if you compare water and data with uh, data for the business, well, if you have clean data, if you have combined data, you are ready to go and survive on the market. So that is one of those uh, things to remember when talking about every reporting or data platform, because data, well, data is good. But if you have clean data, if you have data that is uh, well organized, that can be accessed in a in a good and uh, yeah usable way. It's a good start, and uh, there are two big streams when talking and uh, dealing with data. It's the good old data warehousing approach on the right side. So for all those business analysts out there, that's the approach where data is structured. Data is extracted from source systems. Data is uh, transformed into a way that you can build reports, that you can build a data model based on that data structure. And uh, data warehouses, well, they are really a defined structure because you are preparing the data, you are preparing your dimensions, like customer lists, product lists, and everything like that. And on the other side, you have your measures, like the numbers you want to count, the numbers you want to sum up, like your revenue, your costs, and everything like that. And that is predictable, because you know what are the reports that are required. So you can build your data warehouse in a structure that is, in most of the cases, known upfront. On the other side, well, on the, the right side, we've got the data science approach and the data lake and data scientists that are working with the data. So what is the difference between data warehousing, the structured reporting approach on the one side, and data lake and data scientists on the other side? Well, data scientists, they work, usually work with huge amounts of data. Imagine a machine in your production hall, which is equipped with 60, 100, thousands of sensors, and they produce measurements every second, every 10 milliseconds or whatever. So you get huge amounts of data. And that data is 
required to build some sort of machine learning models on it. That data is maybe a foundation for predictive maintenance. And in order to build machine learning models, data scientists need to work and need to explore data in the data lake. And the data lake is a concept, for those of you that don't know it, well, it's a concept of somehow cheap storage to put and store your data there, but a powerful storage combined with the right technologies to query the data, to explore the data in there, and to build or analyze the data to build machine learning models based on that. So two different worlds, the predicted, well-structured data warehousing side, and on the other side, we have the data scientists that do data exploration that have huge amounts of data, and also changes in the structure of the data. For the data warehouse, well, we have a customer table from SAP, for example. We have uh, revenue information. We have orders coming from SAP, and so on and so forth. But for the data lake, we have sensors. We have sensor values. And over time, machines get better equipped. They get more sensors. There are changes in the measurements. So the structure changes on the side of the data lake storage. And also, there are three big parts, like data. So we've got the data approach on the upper right. We've got the skills approach. And we've got the technology cluster over there. So there are many options for every of that three pieces, like the data. We've got streaming data, like sensor values coming or are streamed to your data platform. There is structured data coming from SAP, unstructured or semi-structured data. There's big data. There's small data. There is um, technologies that work with data in the cloud or on premises. There is Internet of Things technology. So a completely different set of technologies and data. And the technologies that are used to analyze the data, well, they range from data warehousing software like SQL Server, Oracle, SAP, Business Warehouse, something like this, to data lake software to analyze the data, Apache Spark, open source software. And for the skills, people are essential to work with your data. And uh, the skill set of your colleagues, well, it can range from a SQL developer. As I started my career, I worked with a SQL Server, and I prefer to work with a SQL Server. And uh, people working with Python or R or Scala or whatever language, or specialists in data modeling, other specialists doing data cleansing, data engineering. So we've got many different approaches, many different directions people are coming from, and uh, data is produced, and data is coming in every color and shape, as you can imagine, and also the technologies. And those different technologies and, and, and uh, combinations, well, they can lead to data silos too. So they can, well, somehow lead to a solution where a colleague says, no, I'm not able to uh, work with uh, SQL. I, I'm only working with Python. The other colleague says, I'm, I'm, I'm not into Python. I'm only working with SQL. And the other one says, I'm working with the data lake, although I'm uh, working on a data warehouse. So it's, it's not that easy to combine all those different uh, streams of, of interests. And uh, in the good old times, well, I'm in the field and working in the data consultants uh, field for yeah some, some years now. And the good old times, well, it was the data warehouse, the one I've, I've shown you on the, on the slide, which is the, the, the structured uh, data storage. You have your dimensions. You have your measurements. You have your well-defined reports and everything like that. And now with the change of, of requirements in the engineering field, well, is that concept of data warehousing still relevant? And the question or the answer is, yes, it is relevant. But I'm a consultant, so it's the but uh, that I have to, to add here. And whenever we are dealing with uh, those uh, customer requirements, with those workshops, well, it's like, you have a wall with, uh, I don't know, 100 different sheets of, of paper. And uh, you have different opinions. You have different source systems, formats, like uh, data generation intervals and everything like that. So it's not that easy to 
find that one solution that fits it all. So maybe there is some sort of directions we could go. Either we go the left side or either we go the right side. Or is there another direction we could go, like thinking about working on premises, like in your data center, or using the cloud to solve your requ requirements? And uh, what we've seen is the pace of technology. It's not possible to, to solve everything on premises. Because with the cloud, especially with the Azure cloud, you get new technologies, new services, updates, new features in a frequent way that's not possible for any of those administrators to install on your local machine. So let's have a look at a, a proposed architecture of a data warehousing solution in the clouds. And that is the data warehousing architecture before we got Azure Synapse Analytics. So what does the data needs before it can be shown in a report, like Power BI report on that side? Well, we've got data sources. And data can be produced everywhere. It can be produced on premises, like your SAP system, your ERP system, whatever uh, vendor you are using. It can be on premises. It can also live and be generated in the cloud. It can come from devices like your production machine. It can be uh, generated by uh, a temperature sensor or whatever. And there can be software as a service data providers that are needed to get your overview, your, over, your overview about your enterprise data. And that is the, the idea behind the data warehouse, to integrate data from different sources and to get the overview about your data, your company's data. And when we've got the data sources identified, well, we need to, where is my cursor? It's here. We need to ingest the data somewhere. We need to fetch the data from our sources and store it somewhere. So we've got two pieces. We've got the storage. And we've got one technology that does the data transportation and transformation. And uh, before Synapse, well, we had the Azure Data Factory that did and does a good job to transfer the data from source into some sort of storage. And the storage in that data warehousing uh, architecture, well, it's an Azure Data Lake storage that holds the data. And now we've got those two big streams I already talked about, the big data data science approach and the data warehousing approach. And for those two streams, well, Microsoft had two answers. It depends if you want to work with big data. Have a look at Azure Databricks to read the data from the storage, prepare your data, and write the, the results, for example, from machine learning models and, and so on and so forth back to the storage. For the data warehousing approach, there was and is the Azure SQL Data Warehouse, which is now part of the Synapse Analytics. So different ways of data preparation are needed and different technologies were needed. So there was the data, data factory to prepare the data, big data approach using Azure Databricks and SQL Data Warehouse. And on the um, analytics side, plus the reporting side, we had some sort of systems like Azure Machine Learning, Power BI, and so on and so forth to work with the data that is stored in the data warehouse. And now, well, those systems, they, they work great. They, they do a great job, but those are separate systems. So we have Data Factory, Data Bricks, and, and uh, SQL Data Warehouse. And they have, for example, different security approaches. And Microsoft said, well, it's a good approach, and those tools are great. But maybe we could put a new thing, a new label, and use some sort of umbrella to solve the data ingestion, the big data, and the data warehousing side. And what they introduced was Azure Synapse Analytics. And what they did, they did not invent or reinvent the wheel. So they didn't wrote a new data transformation engine. Well, they took the source of Azure Data Factory, 
and they integrated it into the Synapse analytics. They took technology that Databricks uses and they integrated it into Azure Synapse Analytics. And I already mentioned it. The SQL data warehousing part, well, it's integrated in Synapse Analytics too. So just to get a little bit closer and into the Synapse Analytics uh, environment, well, we've got the sources and we've got the data storage on the bottom, in the gray part. It's Azure Data Lake Storage. Cheap storage, powerful storage, very powerful storage. And that is used to store our data. That's the brain of our system. And then we've got work to do. We have to do some analytics. And there are two different flavors. I already talked about the skills of the people. So we've got the SQL skill, so SQL related analytic approach. And for the big data approach, we've got Apache Spark based analytic runtimes. And what is really important are those light blue boxes. It's the integration. Well, that's the thing to get data into the system. It's the overall management. So one central management to manage the data lake storage, to manage the data integration, to manage the SQL and the Spark runtimes. And also, if you have implemented something, well, you need to monitor it. And one of my favorites, security is needed. And you've got one security model in Azure Synapse Analytics. And no different security mechanism for Databricks, for SQL Data Warehouse, for Azure Data Factory. And for the developer, yeah, we've got Azure Synapse Studio. That is the thing where you start your development, where you monitor your development, where you uh, configure your security and do the management. So it's the single point of work to do or to start. And also on the right side, those Power BI and Azure Machine Learning boxes are still there. And that's one thing. Microsoft said, we are integrating the main parts into the Synapse umbrella, but we have the concept of connected or linked services. So we can integrate like, for example, Power BI or Azure Machine Learning or other storage approaches like uh, another data lake storage account, Azure SQL data bases, and so on and so forth. And they work very well with the Synapse. And now, well, many technologies, one umbrella, it should work together. How does it really look like? And that is the, the thing I would like to show you in demos. So we will see the SQL approach, the Synapse SQL approach in, uh, in the demo. We will see the Apache Spark approach, so the big data analytics approach. We will see how to integrate data into the Synapse. And well, Synapse Studio is the tool of our choice, where we can work with the data, where we can work with the artifacts in the Synapse. And now it's a, a little bit of different uh, view. It's, it's almost the same I already talked about. There are two different flavors of, of the analytic runtimes, and I will, I will go into detail in the demo for that. And there's one thing on that slide. It's the languages part. I talked about the SQL and the Spark-based data analytic runtimes, but there is a way of your language of choice. So if you want to work with Python, .NET, Java, Scala, R, whatever, or with a SQL, uh, well, it's your choice which language you would like to use to work with uh, Spark. And uh, that is a, a really great approach I've seen in, in our projects. I've, I've said it before, I'm coming from the SQL side. I'm I'm, I'm SQL developer. I started development with databases in, in SQL Server. And whatever, or in one of our first projects, I started with the well analytic data platform in the cloud and so on and so forth. Well, I had some hard times to solve problems with a SQL, 25, 50, 100 lines of SQL. And then my colleague, my data scientist uh, colleague, uh, they came and said, hey, well, it's 
two lines of code in Scala. It's one line of code in Python. You could do it that way. And then I started to look well around the corner and tried some other languages. And there's a great approach of notebooks built into Synapse that allows you to switch languages during your development. So that is a very, very nice approach if you know Python, for example. And if you know a little bit of SQL, you can combine those two different approaches in one of your development approaches. And the, the overall concept of, of Synapse Analytics and uh, all those services and data storages and technologies and uh, outside or linked services to Synapse, well, and also the name of the system, when we think about our brain, we've got brain cells and we've got some synapses in there. And we learn, we as a human, we learn when there are additional connections between our brain cells. And that is the thing where I think Microsoft had some sort of, hey, if we combine data, living and, uh, well, yeah, living in different islands of data, and if we combine them, we can learn and we can get better. So Synapse Analytics, well, it has some sort of meaning in the background. And with that, I'm going to start my demo. And uh, we're going to use Synapse Studio. So uh, just one question for Simon. Do we have some questions so far? Not yet. Not yet, uh, Wolfgang. But everyone can see a screen. You are good. OK, perfect. So Azure Synapse Analytics, it's an Azure service. And if you instantiate one, well, if you go here and we want to create a new Azure Synapse workspace, well, where is it? What we create is the umbrella. And that umbrella needs to be filled with uh, the, the different pieces. So what is required in a Synapse Analytics, well, it's called Workspace. It's a SQL, or sorry, it's a data lake storage account. Because Synapse needs some place to store the metadata. So Synapse Workspace, there is the need of a primary data lake storage account. And if we want to analyze data, we have to instantiate and configure additional pools, runtimes, analytic runtimes. And if we have a look here on the overview screen, what we see here is we've got, in our demo environment, the SQL pools here and the Apache Spark pools over there. And uh, I've got two Apache Spark pools in my demo environment. So let's see here. And those Apache Spark pools, they can have different sizes. And Apache Spark pools, it's always the question of money and costs. Apache Spark pools are built by the consumption. So you can configure a Spark pool, and you only start and use it whenever you need it. And when the work is done, you can shut it down. And it's almost the same for one kind of SQL pools over here. We've got two different flavors of SQL pools. We've got the dedicated SQL pools. And those are the SQL data warehousing, uh, well, yeah, database systems. And they are compared or can be compared to the Spark-based building approach because you start your SQL dedicated pool and it's built. If you pause it, you don't have to pay for the compute. You only have to pay for the storage. And there's another concept of SQL pool, which is called serverless pool. And that is a very, very nice uh, approach. You will see it in the demo that you can use to analyze data in the data lake. And that is just there. And it scales whenever it needs more performance. And it just shuts down or scales down whenever it's not needed anymore. And that one is built by the amount of data you are processing. So those are the, the things we put together and we put into our uh, Synapse workspace. And now, Synapse Studio, it's the development environment. 
And I've got one workspace over here, the, the Kubido Synapse Playground. Uh, and what you see here, those are the four, well, main buttons, main uh, menu items over here. What we could start with is we could start with ingesting data, explore and analyze data, and or visualize data. But if you are new to Synapse, I would recommend to start with the fourth button over here, which is the Learn button. And within that Learn button, or it's also here in the menu, the Knowledge Center. If you start in the Knowledge Center, you get a huge list of samples. You get a huge list of data sets, public data sets, that you can use and start your data journey in Synapse. So you can use or create uh, samples directly. So if you want to learn SQL, the SQL serverless approach in Synapse, you can create a sample. You can create sample data and sample notebooks for work with Spark. Or we can browse the public data set gallery, like COVID data, taxi data from New York, and so on and so forth. And you can just start over here uh, if you want to analyze the New York taxi data. And you've got the description, an overview, a preview of data, what is in there. So I would recommend to have a look at the Knowledge Center if you are new to Synapse. But now let's dive a little bit deeper. What you see on the left side is the, where is it? Where's my mouse? It's here. They are called hubs. Well, it's those menu items. And there is a data menu item, a develop and integrate. And those are the three I would like to start with. The data hub, it's there to browse your data artifacts in your uh, Synapse environment. So we've got one tab over here listing the databases. And when we have a little bit of a closer look, we can see that we have different icons over here. So we've got three different icons. And those are the three different SQL, or not, sorry, those are the three different analytic pools. So the, the green ones, those are the dedicated pools, the data warehousing. And they are powerful because it's not a normal SQL server, it's a cluster. Imagine you have 60 compute nodes, you have 60 different databases in the background, data is distributed, data is replicated, and so on and so forth. So that is the powerful engine to solve your data problems when dealing with the data warehousing approach. The red ones, those are databases created for the use of the SQL serverless approach. So for data exploration, for data preparation in a little bit. And the last but not least, the blue ones, those are Spark databases. So coming from the Spark analytic runtime to, uh, well, do big data analytics to store the data, not in the data lake, back to the data lake, but to store it in Spark databases. So that is the first thing. So we can have a look here. If you know SQL Server Management Studio, it's similar to that one. So we can have a look at the the few, we can start that one, we can query the few, we can query the, the, the data, and uh, we can have a look at all those structures, like the data warehousing approach, where we have tables, where we have some sort of tables in here, and you can have a look at the columns, and so on and so forth. So nothing really special over here. On the other side, we've got the linked services. So those are the data storages that are approached and connected to Synapse. And we've got our, or one, data lake storage attached to our Synapse workspace. And we've got the containers in there. And what we can do is we can browse those containers. Like we can have a look at some files in the data lake, like that one over here. And we can do a right click and some sort of preview. So what is in that file in the data lake? Imagine we are now, well, working as a data scientist. We want to know what is stored in the data lake, what can be achieved in the data lake, what, what, what is the structure of our files. So you can just do a right click and do a preview. 
what we can also do is we can start data preparation by using or creating a new notebook. So let's try that one. And what is generated is a notebook. If you don't know the, the concept of notebooks, well, have a look at notebooks because they are great and they are popping up in, in different uh, kind of tools. They are in Azure Data Studio, in, in uh, Visual Studio Code, in Spark over here. And what it's the idea behind a notebook. It's the combination of source code and documentation and, well, data preparation results. So you can mix cells. They are called cells. You can have a code cell and you have, can have markdown cells for your documentation, like over here. And uh, you can create some sort of markdown documentation over here and write your documentation in there. You can just edit that and what so on and so forth. What you can also do is you can specify the default language within your notebook. So that is the thing. Power BI developers, well, you can select the language of choice. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a Power Query M here, but we will have some sort of Power Query in the data integration, uh, data ingestion part. So you can specify the language of choice and you can override and change the language within every cell. So you can start with PySpark, you can change it to SQL in the next, and you can change it to Python, for example. And all those results generated by one cell can be reused in the next cell. So very, very powerful approach. What you can also do is you can start analyzing and exploring the data lake using SQL. And that one is using the built-in, the serverless approach. So there's a generated script. And that script, well, it reads the content of the file. And there is some sort of information we need to um, we need to, to add here, terminator, like we need to specify the field selection over here. And um, we also skip the, the first row. So we only need the data. And what we can also do is we can add like some sort of structure to the result. We can have a look of the data. So that one is population data uh, from the part of Austria where I live. So I can do some sort of uh, selection for the, the town I live in, and we can have a look at the population. And what you see here is, well, it's the youngest entry. It's coming from 2019. And there is one thing we could do and change in that query is we could change that specific file path to some sort of wildcard because in the data lake, we've got a new and additional file which has the population of 2020 in it. And if we specify and change it and add that wildcard in here, we get or we get the, the, the content of multiple files in the data lake. And what we can do now as a next step is, well, we can store the data in a few, or no, we, we, we can't store the data in a few, we can create a few. So we can create, create few like population data, and we can create a new database. So I'm going to create the new database, which is C sharp corner and create that one. Change to the new database. So we are now working in the new database and I create a few back to the workspace browser, refresh over here. So that is here and we've got the few in here. And we are directly querying the data lake using a few. So what is there for the Power BI developer, you would say? Well, that can be used as a logical layer 
above the data lake. So you can use the uh, serverless pool to serve as a logical data warehousing layer, for example, for your Power BI reports. But before we get into that, well, we need to have a look at the data integration thing, because data needs to come from somewhere into our Synapse environment. And what we have in here is the Synapse pipelines. And Synapse pipelines, if you have seen Azure Data Factory, they look familiar and they look similar because it's almost, almost 100% of source code that is coming from the data factory and is seen in Synapse pipelines. And there's one thing, so we are almost at 100% because there's one thing missing in Azure Data Factory. We've got the Power Query transformation. We've got wrangling data flows like Power Query you know from Power BI Desktop or from uh, Power BI or Power Apps uh, data flows. So that is a pro an approach that will come to Synapse. So skill set of Power Query transformations can be used in the future. It's not there today in Synapse pipelines to get data into that environment. In the development section, we've got a way of, well, querying data. We can have SQL scripts and we can query data. So we can query uh, a table like having 83 million rows, or we can query like data or, well, tables having more than 660 million rows and perform some joins, group buys, and everything like that. In the background, it's powered by the SQL pools. So we've got the powerful, the clustered approach in the background here. It's the dedicated pools that are working there. And, well, we've got data prepared and we want to analyze it. So we've got Power BI on that side. And what is there, it was one on, on one of the slides, it's the concept of linked services. And within your Synapse workspace, we can have a look at the linked services. And as you can see, I've got some linked services already defined, pointing to SQL, pointing to blob storage, to data lake storage. And there's one linked services that is pointing to a Power BI workspace. So what you can do is you can create a linked service coming from Synapse workspace and mapping to an existing workspace in your Power BI environment, like that one. So the Synapse integration demo workspace is mapped into Power BI, or in Synapse, sorry. And let's go over here. It's found here. So we've got our data workspace over here, including the Power BI data sets already there, and also having some reports. So we can have a, a look at the, the reports in your Power BI. Oh, sorry. I wanted to show you a demo. Let's see if that one works. And uh, you can have a look at the, the, the reports in Power BI. But what we can also do is we start to create a new Power BI data set. And the Power BI data set, it can be started here. So we have to select the Power BI or the, the, the analytic runtime, the SQL runtime, and we select the newly generated uh, data set, uh, database and download the PBIDS file, the data source file. Start that one and the data model itself, it needs to be created in Power BI Desktop. There is no way of creating a Power BI data model in the service as of today. So Power BI Desktop opens, and what we see on the next part over here, it creates, by the use of the PBIDS file, a connection to our new population data view. And we can load that one into our data set. So next step, next question, import or direct query. I'm going to select the import, not today, I'm going to select the direct query option. And what we get now is a data model, a simple data model containing one table 
which is mapped to a few in your SQL serverless approach, which is querying data in your data lake. So we can have a look at the population in my hometown over the years, over the last years. And it's only my hometown. So it's just my hometown in that data set. So nothing else is in there. If we go back to Synapse, if we go back to the definition of our view, we have it somewhere here. It should be here. And if I change the alter, I change the view definition, I just remove the filter for the city and I change the definition. So the view definition is updated. And if I refresh that one over here, let's see if we get more data. Yeah, we get more data. So we can have a look at the What's there? Oh my God, what is wrong here? Ah, we need to change it again. Not only the first hundred rows, change it over here, refresh, and it's data, 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 wait for the data. So it should update now, working on it. Yeah, we've got data from different cities in my home uh, region. Next step is publish the data set. So C sharp population, and we publish that one to the mapped workspace. So it's the Synapse integration workspace, like that one. And there's one technical step we need to do. We need to go to the Power BI workspace over here, and it's here. And there's one thing we need to do. It's the data source credentials. It's only here for setting two files or setting two, two options, selecting the right user. And now we are done with the configuration. So that is not possible today in Synapse, but Back to Synapse development, come over here, refresh, refresh that one. Let's see, oh, let's see if the, yeah, the C sharp population data set is here. We can create a new report. We can add some filters. Or for the other users, you can just open the already existing report. And you can have a look and analyze your data without leaving the tool. So Power BI is integrated here. And there are some parts where Power BI is integrated already. So unfortunately, it's only one workspace you can map from Power BI to your Synapse environment. I hope that there will be an option of mapping multiple Power BI workspaces. And there's one thing within the integration hub it is already there in the data factory and will be there in Synapse pipelines. It's the Power Query transformation. They are called wrangling data flows. And that is a very, very powerful way to use your knowledge of Power Query transformations and use it in a concept that is, well, a little bit broader, that is powered by uh, clusters in the background, like the Spark clusters, like data lake storage, like dedicated SQL pools. And uh, Synapse Studio, you've seen it in the demo, it's the one tool for development in uh, Synapse to create ingestion, to transform your data, to analyze your data, and even create reports based on your data models in Power BI. SQL pools, I talked about uh, that topic. We've got the data warehousing approach and the data exploration, the SQL serverless approach. And we've got the Apache Spark, the choose your own language you would like to work with, the notebook-based approach. And it's a very powerful approach where you can work, have a look at the results, 
store the results and share it with your colleagues. And you can even automate those notebooks. For the data ingestion part, mapping data flows is one part of the story. And those wrangling data flows marked with a star, well, they are available in the data factory and it's Power Query. You can use it to read data and write it to your Synapse environment. Power BI and Synapse, they are integrated, as you've seen, create a new data set. That, that needs to be done in Power BI Desktop. But afterwards, you can use and reuse that data set and create open few work with your Power BI reports directly and integrated in Synapse Analytics. And for the data integration part, for those of you that know the Power Platform data flows approach, like depicted here with the Power BI data flows, they are storing the data in CDM folders, common data model folders in a data lake. And that is one of those stories that can be extended, like generating data using data flows and reusing that one in, for example, Azure SQL Data Warehouse or Synapse Pipelines or Azure Data Factory to read the data, to write it back over here, and maybe, well, do some data preparation here and write the data to a CDM folder that is afterwards used in a Power BI data set. So huge connections within the data integration and data preparation part between Synapse Azure Technology and Power BI and Data Platform and Power Platform. Sorry for that. And with that, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. Just a short recap. We've got the Azure Synapse Analytics workspace in the middle. We've got two different big approaches of analytic runtimes, the SQL and the Spark runtimes, central storage using data lake storage, and the huge part of integrated and linked services. Power BI, other storage systems, and so on and so forth. And uh, is it everything? No, there's another thing that is coming that is planned for August 2021. It's the Performance Accelerator for Azure Synapse Analytics. Well, what's that? Imagine a Power BI report that uh, is used heavily, that is uh, connecting to a SQL dedicated pool in the background. And it's using almost the same query over and over. And what the Performance Accelerator does, it generates so-called materialized views in the background. And that is a very powerful thing, because with a materialized view, you define a select statement. And that select statement, well, the results of that select statements are cached. They are stored. They are persisted. And whenever there's a change in one of those source tables, those materialized views are updated. And now imagine those statements are used in Power BI. And the materialized views are generated automatically. So it's a very, very powerful way of improving the reporting uh, performance and the speed of your uh, results in the Power BI reports. And to go a little bit further and above, like 10,000 meters above, it's the overall data landscape in your environment. It's not only Synapse that connects and uh, collects data from somewhere. It's the data that is stored somewhere in your system. And there you need some sort of data catalog. Data, gov data governance is one part of the story. And there's a new service, which is called Azure Perfu, which does the scanning, which does the classification of data, which does the data lineage. So where is your data generated? What is done during the data uh, journey? And what is the result? So Azure Synapse is part of the whole story. Power BI is part of the whole story. And they are working very, very well together. And with that, I'm at the end of my session. Mm -hmm.